Extension is the outreach arm of the university. What that means is when the university was founded 150 years ago, they were uh, told by the state of Ohio that is payment for your land, you will radiate um, the knowledge and research to all Ohioans. So we are outward facing. We are in all 88 counties, and even though I work for OSU Extension here in Franklin County, um, I'm engaging you more as my client residents of Franklin County, the 1.31 million of us that, um, that we do our programming with. And so I'm in agriculture and natural resources. We have three other program areas. Community development is about uh, financial literacy. Family and Consumer Sciences, FCS, is uh, nutrition and health. And then where a lot of people have some familiarity with extension is in our youth leadership and development program area, and that is 4-H. So what we're going to be talking about today is starting the summer garden. And there's going to be a lot of this. This is introductory stuff. So if you are a seasoned grower, hopefully you'll get a few uh, nuggets of wisdom out of this. Feel free to ask questions. Dump them in the chat box right now. But what we're seeing is an absolutely explosive growth in people that want to start gardening. They want to learn how to grow. It's an outstanding activity to do, get you outside, maintain your health and wellness, maintain social distance, provides uh, in, you know, food into your personal and family food security, maybe one less trip to the store wearing a mask. And so that's when we really started to ramp up our outreach to serve all of you guys with this needed skill. So what I tell folks is, if, if you're just getting started and, and there's plenty of time in this growing season, please believe me, make yourself a plan. And, and I say that because if you have a plan that is going to minimize some of the potential problems you'll see down the way. What I try to do when I am engaging a brand new gardener is I try to get success right out of the box because nothing drives people out of growing faster than you you know, you get a bunch of land ready, you spend a bunch of money, you get your tools, your plants, you do all of those things, you're expecting a harvest, and then you don't get what you're expected harvest um, and, and that can be very disappointing and discouraging. So we want to make a plan. We want to make sure we pick a great site. We want to make sure we get the soil ready. We want to play, um, make sure that we plant appropriately for our season and, and then keep records over the course of the year. So I'm a, a seasoned grower. I've been doing this a long time, but I try to take lots of pictures because what has really changed my game in terms of how I do a plan and, and how I adjust my plan year to year is my phone. I take pictures of my garden all the time from various angles and what that does is that is a digital record of what I'm growing and, and when I'm growing it and my phone saves that for me at time and date stamps it and it sticks it in a chat or it sticks it in the um, in a folder on my phone. So then I use that data to adjust my plan every year. For example, last year I had just a tremendous problem with deer in my community garden. They just grazed everything. We had seven of them there at one time. And what I found was is they would walk past a lot of my colleagues and they would eat my stuff because right off the bat, I planted sugar snap peas and that is a preferred forage food for deer. They love them as much as I do. So they hammered the peas and then they came back and checked and checked and checked. So um, this year for the first time in 24 years, I did not plant sugar snaps and I'm adjusting a little bit on what I plant and how I protect it. So make a plan and then keep data and you don't got to spend a lot of time on it. Use your phone. That's what I do. Okay, so you want to grow. You're ready to tear up the back 40. You're ready to put a garden in. We're talking today about food production. We're talking fruit and veg. And those crops prefer to have as much sun as you can possibly give them. They would like full sun. You'll see six to eight hours of sun in places. Master Gardener Training Manual says at least eight to 10 hours of sun. The more, the better. You wanna to try to avoid trees. You wanna avoid buildings. You want to try to get south face full bore sun. But a lot of people will tell me, they'll be like, Tim, you know, I don't have that ideal spot. I'm growing on the east side of my house, the west side of my garage. I might have only half a day of sun and that's okay. If you only have a half a day of sun, you can still grow. What I tell folks is, adjust your variety selection so that you get varieties in the ground that will mature faster. Meaning that if you had half a day of sun and you wanted to grow tomatoes, 
you're probably going to find it challenging if you went for a very long maturing, like a big, huge heirloom slicer, like a brandy wine or something that might take 110 days to maturity. Whereas if you picked varieties that matured quicker, maybe cherry tomatoes, maybe saladette styles like a Juliet or some of the early ripening tomato varieties like first ladies or early girls, those are closer to 55, 58, 60, 65 day maturing, which means that you will get a harvest. So the way we talk about that is the right plant in the right place. If you want to plant something, try to find a variety that matures faster. You'll find that even within different plant varieties, there can be a very wide range of, of maturation times. So choose the right plant for the right place. And then let's talk about watering for a little bit. We just had a really interesting uh, shift in our last seven days or so. I measured nearly six inches of rain on the two-day period that we had early last week on the rain gauge. And then we went Friday into four days of 85 and higher degree temperatures. And actually, most vegetables hate both of those. So we've had some swings in our weather. But make sure that you realize that when we're talking food production, especially vegetables, especially vegetables at maturity that are in heavy harvest, they need a fairly decent amount of water. So as you're making your plan and you're getting your garden in place, what is your watering strategy? What is your watering source? You're gonna to need to be able to get water to that. It can be adjusted by your soil type and it can be adjusted by your planting um, production system. My community garden is river bottom clay. So that just absorbs tons of water and then can dry out and become like a brick. It doesn't drain really, really rapidly like a sandy soil profile would do that. Are you growing in a raised bed? Raised beds will dry out faster, which can be beneficial when we've had tremendous amounts of rain. But if it's really hot out there, they are going to dry out faster. And that means you might need to irrigate more. And realize that water is super heavy. So when you are planning on your water, if you're thinking you're going to haul water for a vegetable garden, that can get really old really fast. And then the last thing is, any design planting that you do, and that's your vegetable garden, that's your lawn, that could be an orchard, that could be a soy field, realize that those are agriculture and not mother nature. So mother nature likes to overhead water when she rains, but for a lot of our vegetables, especially those ones that we grow in summer, they prefer not to have their leaves wet. I recommend that the majority of your watering should be irrigation that you do at the base of the plant. You deliver that right down where the plant is in a zone where the roots are gonna go. That will maintain those leaves uh, staying dry, which will decrease the instance of fungal disease. Plants get the same bacterial, viral, fungal diseases like we get, um, but they are way overrepresented in terms of fungal disease. Now, Tim, does this mean that um, this goes for like tomato plants and stuff like that? You shouldn't get their leaves wet? Ideally not. So if I'm going to do um, uh, irrigation where I'm worried that I might get the leaves wet, I would do it early in the morning so they have a chance to dry out during the day. So we got a couple questions in the chat. And for Paul, I am going to put in a um, link for soil testing. So the question was, hey, Tim, what's the easiest way to get a soil test kit, kit, for, kit for pH? Uh, soil testing, we're going to talk about here in a couple of slides. It is an outstanding tool, and you want to do that because it it's going to tell you exactly what you need. Um, the problem that we have is we normally would sell soil test kits out of our office, but since we're closed, I'm recommending folks go to this company right here, Spectrum Analytic. You can look them up online. They are an Ohio company, and right online you can download the form needed to sample for that, and you can harvest a soil sample in the root zone about six to eight inches down in your targeted area you want to plant in. Send that to them. Let them know what you're going to grow there and then they will guide you based on those results on what you need to do for your fertilization strategy. And then um, there's a question about propagating lilacs from cuttings. Uh, we are probably okay um, in terms of doing softwood cuttings. I like to use brand new growth that end of brand new growth. Um, we just had our flowering of our lilacs. I can see mine right outside the window right here. For highest level of success for your softwood cuttings, get the brand new growth 
um, as green a growth as you can get and get that in a pot and um, and uh, create sort of a humidity dome around that. So right there, eight lilac cutting rooting right now. Perfect. Okay. So you have lots of tools in your toolbox that you can use as a grower. One of the things that I like to do is I prioritize my soil health, right? Because once you picked your spot, you figured out how you're going to water it, the input that you really get to adjust going forward is you get to adjust your soil health. I do that by trying to add as much organic matter as I possibly can in there, as well as try to mitigate loss of organic matter. I want to spare the loss of it through things like harvest and tillage and working the soil. Other tools in your toolbox that I like to use, especially if you're getting started um, or you're in an urban environment with, uh, with limited space, things like raised beds. I'm a huge fan of mulch, whether that is an organic or non-organic mulch. Crop rotation is a great tool in your toolbox. Integrated pest management, meaning instead of just relying strictly on you know, a pesticide to treat pests, realizing that you have lots of different things that you can do in terms of timing of your planting, maintaining beneficial insect populations, maintaining biodiversity, um, because we have a number of pests now that are pretty resistant to almost every pesticide. And then the use of season extension, which we'll talk a little bit about, but I like to grow all year long, and I find that Ohio is an outstanding four season, 12 month out of the year growing environment. So, Plants have a certain number of nutrients that they absolutely have to have. The majority they get from soil. Some of them they get from water or air like carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen. The key thing to realize is these are rate limiting. So if they are deficient in any one of these, the plant's growth will stop until that is supplemented and then it will raise to wherever the next rate limiting nutrient is. A soil test can tell you all of them even through the minor nutrients, although most base soil tests really only go through about four or five of the, um, the most important macronutrients. When you add organic matter into your soil, you are adding all of these nutrients because organic matter at its very nature is pieces of things that were alive in the past, which means they're going to have all of these nutrients in there. And then realize they don't need them all in the same amounts. Some of these they need in parts per million. Some of these they need in very, very large amounts, but they have to have all of them. And if there's a deficiency in there, it generally manifests through some sort of stunted growth or color change in the leaves or um, deformalities in the leaves and um, and that's where we talk about how important a soil test is. So this is what we used to have out of our office. We used to have soil test kits that we kept um, that we could sell to client residents that were from Penn State University soil lab and this is a screen capture from the top half of one of these and the thing that I want to stress when you look at this is when I harvested this soil this was from a community garden on the east side of Columbus in the Shepherd neighborhood of Columbus. The soil looked amazing. The soil looked perfect and beautiful. It was rich and crumbly and you would have thought that you could have put a plant in here and you would have had amazing growth. When we got the test result back, what we found actually was it was tremendously deficient in both phosphorus and potassium. So if a grower would have put plants in here and not addressed these fertility problems, they would have had a horrible year. This is a recipe for disaster. One of the things they would have grown tremendous amounts, however, of is weeds, because weeds do not read the soil test. They don't care how much fertility is in there. They live here, they're used to nobody feeding them. And this would have been a tremendously weedy patch. Generally, what we found is if you match the fertility of your plantings to the plant that you wish to thrive in that situation, they actually can compete pretty well with weeds. And in fact, a lot of times, um, a really weedy area is more indicative of nutrient deficiencies um, present in that area. So that is where we recommend now that you would send that to Spectrum Analytic. And it's, a, it's, um, it's great, it's like $12 for the soil test. And the thing I like about Spectrum as compared to Penn State is, Spectrum actually has organic matter on their test as a normal component of that. So this is basically the best 12 bucks that you would ever spend. And I recommend that this becomes part of your plan. You don't necessarily have to do it every year unless you have really bad um, deficiencies. I tell folks, get it to where you want it and then maybe check about every three years or so. 
So there's two common ways that folks will add fertilizer when they're growing. You have a slow release, um, large particle like a granular. Think of how you do your lawn when you get the bag of fertilizer and you do a drop spreader or, or a sling spreader going around on that. They rate for about two or three months of feeding. Um, you want to make sure that you get a complete fertilizer so that it has all the macro and micronutrients in it. The other way that fertilization is done is generally with a water soluble product where you deliver the nutrients in the irrigation into the root zone. Those generally recommend to be done about every week, maybe every two weeks on there. One of the things to realize is depending on which system you have, you're going to have a faster acting or a slower acting onset of, um, of positive effects when you do your fertilization. So if you're seeing a nutrient deficiency, you probably would not want to remediate that with that slow release granular. You're going to use a water soluble product because it's going to go much faster up into the plant system. But when we see rainfall events like we had this past week where we had just tremendous amount of rainfall, you can lose fertility really fast in the soil profile, especially if it is that water soluble product. And we saw this last year. If you guys remember last year, the growing season was pretty unusual in that it was tremendously rainy, multiple two and three inch rain events on any given week, all the way up through June. And right around the 4th of July weekend, it stopped, turned 95 degrees, and didn't rain again barely until Labor Day. What this, hap what, this, what this did is anyone who had happened to plant their summer veg in a time window in say May or June when people normally are planting those plants, even if they gave adequate fertility at that time, that much rain just completely drove that out of the soil profile. And I got lots of um, complaints from growers who were sending me pictures of their plants in very stunted growth. And when we talked about fertility, they had fertilized. But what had happened was that much rain had actually driven all of the fertilizer out of the soil down into the subsoil where it was inaccessible to the plants. So if we have rainfall events like we had the other day, which was a six inch rainfall event, um, if you had been using water soluble fertilizer in, in any you know, period up to a few days before that, you can assume that that was completely washed away and um, made unavailable to the plant. So the guidance on here of feed every couple few months or feed every week or every two weeks are guides. You need to adjust that based on what kind of uh, irrigation uh, or rainfall events we have. So let's talk about organic matter for a second. Um, like I said, I try to work on this a lot. And if you get a soil test from Spectrum, it's going to give you a percentage of your soil that is uh, the organic matter fraction. And the ideal would be 5% or greater. But I can tell you that's not as easy as it sounds. That sounds like a very tiny number, but, but that 5% is where the magic occurs in the soil. And I'm always trying to work on mine and increase it. Last test that I had, I had about 3.8%. It takes a long time to build up organic matter in the soil. It can take a very short time for that organic matter to get lost by heavy tillage or, or by heavy rainfall events. So I'm always trying to build it, but I'm always trying to minimize my loss of it. Lots of ways you can add. Compost is one. I'm a composter. I have a compost pile. I've been uh, using it heavily. In fact, my pile is probably 80% gone right now. Um, Manure, when I worked in the country, I could get composted manure or manure that I would add generally in the fall so it had enough time to incorporate and break down in the soil so we had a safe planting situation. And then leaves is something that I build my compost pile out of and I use as many of them as I can get my hands on. Leaves are outstanding sources of organic matter. If you think of what a leaf is, Think of how a tree grows, right? It sends its roots deep down into the subsoil and it scavenges up nutrients that would be unavailable to most plantings. It turns that into leaves, which are organic matter, and then sprinkles them all over your yard in the fall. There's a reason why most cities and municipalities actually will send a truck to vacuum those leaves up off of the tree lawn when you put them out there or they'll do a yard waste pickup is. That's found money they turn that into compost and sell it back to us. It's not because they like us or because they're being super nice. They actually can make a product out of that that is worth something. So make sure you are using your leaves. Um, like I said, what I do is I try to use up my entire compost pile by the 
fall. And then I start my new one with the leaves from the trees in my yard. So there's actual data that supports this, right? That state up north did a study and they found that for every 1% that you can increase your soil organic matter, that is a 12% increase in crop yields. And that is a unbelievable uh, number. If you can get a 12% increase in yield without extra fertilizer, just by working slowly on building up your soil organic matter, that is really gonna impact your harvest in a positive way. So what is compost? I don't know if we have any composters here. Basically, what I do is I have my leaves, that's my carbon, my nitrogen or my green source is kitchen scraps. I don't add anything else in there. I don't have a source of a manure that I would add uh, into my compost pile living in the city here. But what I tell folks is compost is that end product of the decay of organic matter. And, and why organic matter is so important in the soil is it is a intermediate sized particle that spaces out the two major particles in soil, right? You have clay particles, which are extraordinarily tiny. And then you have sand particles, which by comparison are absolutely giant. And and they don't play well together. Meaning if you had really clay soil, you wouldn't add tons of sand to it to remediate it. And if you had sandy soil, you wouldn't add tons of clay to it. That, that's basically the recipe for a brick. You need to add an intermediate sized particle that will space those out a little bit. And the nice thing about organic matter is it has tons of binding sites that holds onto fertilizer. And I wouldn't necessarily call it a fertilizer, but I've done lots of soil testing on compost, both homemade compost and municipal made compost, and they are absolutely packed full of nutrients. Um, you can get years of certain nutrients into your production system simply from organic matter. So what I call it is this, the amendment of choice uh, for all soil types, and I am always working on trying to get mine um, increased. All right, let's check out our chat question. Tim, this driving out of fertility applies to the lawn as well. Yes, it does. So um, I am going to reapply. I started, so the question is, Tim, is this driving of fertility applies to lawns as well um, as gardens? And yes, it does. The fertilizers that most folks use, if you use a drop spreader and you put down, um, you know, that, that fertility that, Generally, they recommend you feed your lawn maybe three or four times a year. That much rain that we had probably has caused some leaching out of that. I will um, reapply here soon. I don't like to apply lawn fertilizer when it's in super um, hot weather like this. It doesn't work as well. And um, I, I generally need to irrigate a little bit if we get deep into summer. Um, but I will be addressing my lawn fertility as well because I'm on my second year of me redoing my lawn and I don't want to lose all the work that I put into it. So two major ways that people grow and both of these can be fabulous ways to grow in a backyard environment. Raised bed growing versus row crop growing. Row crops generally um, are used in, in most high production agronomic systems because this is something that you can do with machine planting, machine fertilizing, and machine harvesting to get very large production out of that space. Um, the thing that I don't like about it is, if you take a look at this picture of this cornfield, and while the machine is only gonna go through it a few times when it does its planting and harvesting, in a backyard garden, you're gonna be walking on the pathways between your plantings very commonly. And that's where the roots of most of those plantings are, especially laterally rooted crops like tomatoes or corn. So whenever you walk on a row, uh, in between rows in a row planting situation, you're actually compacting the soil where those roots are. And that makes it less likely that they're going to be able to expand into large root volumes. And it's gonna decrease their ability to take up water and take up nutrients because plants do their uptake of water and nutrients through their roots. So I like to use raised bed uh, planting technique and basically raised beds are a concept that have been around for a long, long time. Here you can see some that have forms built up in this picture to hold a larger soil volume up in the air. It doesn't necessarily need to be that way. Originally they were just formed with a garden rake to get about two or three inches up um, off of the ground level. They have some pluses and they have some minuses. For example, 
they warm up faster in the spring and they drain faster in wet weather, that's a good uh, thing in the spring. But in the summer, they're going to heat up faster and they're going to dry out faster. So you realize that there's pluses and minuses in your raised bed system. The thing that I really like about them is I make them to a size where I can reach from the outside into the middle of the raised bed where I never ever have to walk in my raised beds. And what that does is it avoids compaction of the soil. So avoiding that compaction of the soil by never walking on it means that I will always have an uncompacted great soil tilth where my roots of my plantings can extend in all directions out there, which allows them to grow much larger, healthier root systems. Also, in a row system, if you are watering, if you are applying nutrients, you generally are applying it around the plants, but you'll get some bleed out into the rows where that's um, where that is going to decrease kind of the efficiency of that system because that's where the weeds can be. With a raised bed system, I concentrate all my inputs, my watering, my weeding, my planting, my organic matter, fertilization, everything goes in the growing system area and I don't have to do any watering, weeding or anything like that on the outside paths because I use mulch there. Uh, so it maximizes my inputs in my growing space. Now, sizing of a raised bed is very, very important because since you don't ever want to walk in it, you need to make it so that you can reach into the middle for planting, harvesting, weeding, or whatever without stepping on it. For average adult-sized people, that is about four feet wide. You can reach the middle of that without stepping in it. For tiny-sized humans, if I go to school gardens or things like that, I recommend that they make them about three feet wide because their arms are shorter. And even though they will still run up and down through the middle of those raised beds, um, at least you made it a width that should work for them. So four feet wide, it can be as long as you want it to be. Realize, though, that you'll have to walk all the way around it to get to the other side. And and then when you're making your garden plan, if you decide to go with a raised bed system, make sure that you do a little bit of math ahead of time. So if we go back to that picture right here, a four by eight raised bed at 12 inch tall boards, that's 32 cubic feet of soil just for that one bed. And a cubic yard of soil is 27 cubic feet. If you do multiple raised beds, make sure you do the mathematics so that you know how much soil to get because you might find that you need a tremendous amount of soil where you're getting a bulk soil delivery. So this is a picture of my garden and you'll notice that I have no forms in this garden. Uh, this is a multi-acre community garden that gets rototilled with a Ford tractor so it is not a permanent um, space in terms of what I can build on it. Everything has to be removed because the bush hog comes through November 1st and then the tractor comes through again with the rototiller April 1st. I still use raised bed technique. It's not perfect because the soil does get mixed with my neighbor's soil. So I, I can build soil health as much as I possibly can in my space. And then I share some of that with my neighbors. And depending on their management system, I might not be getting back um, as good of soil health. But I do what I do in my system. And I use raised bed technique, meaning that if you take a look at this picture, where the mulch is, and you can see it extended out this way, that's where the tractor tire drove, and that is where the compaction from that tractor of several thousand pounds has really compacted that soil. So that becomes my pathways for the entire year. I used to be able to get lots of organic matter mulch when I worked in the country. Now I use plastic culture, which I like even more, to be honest. Then I use a garden rake and I form a raised bed in between these tractor tires where the rototiller had loosened the soil. And then this is my raised bed. So that is where my inputs go. That's where all my um, planting goes. That's where my fertility, organic matter, all of those things. And then I never walk on that again for the rest of that season. So it's a raised bed modified technique, but it, it's me making do with what I have in my system. If I had any sun in my yard, I would love to have a bunch of raised beds up there, but my yard is deep shade under walnuts, maples, and hackberries, except for one tiny little spot on my driveway. All right. For, we got a question for raised beds. Should there be anything on the bottom of the bed? We put down trash bags to avoid weeds. Is this okay? So I recommend that if you have anything 
near decent quality soil underneath your raised bed that you would not have a liner between the raised bed soil and the soil underneath because that is going to improve over time as you work on your soil's um, health. And the nice thing is, is those are spots where you can get extra root growth out of your plantings. Now, there's a lot of folks that if they build raised beds and they put it on really poor quality soil, or I've even seen raised beds put um, on parking lots or other uh, completely unusable, where they had to build high sides up that way, those ones um, would generally have a liner. So, in, especially if you had some kind of contamination from maybe heavy, heavy metals or something like you might have on some of the um, remediated urban sites. But I recommend that you would not use a liner underneath that because that is going to decrease your root volume that you can go in. If you are creating a raised bed from scratch and you had some weed problems underneath it, and I've done that before, what I do is I put a liner made of organic matter, like uh, layers of newspaper or layers of thin cardboard. And what that does is that is gonna kill the weeds that were on that space, but then break down slowly over time. So it will kill the weeds, turn into organic matter, and then over time, those plants are gonna be able to use that increased space for potential root growth. So since you mentioned walnuts, is there a way to mitigate the dreaded black walnut poison problem? And how long does it last in the soil after a tree is taken out? Um, so I will tell you that my compost pile is underneath my walnut tree. And while I don't intentionally add any of those walnut leaves into that compost pile, I used my front yard maple tree leaves. There are some remnants of things that might fall into it. And I've never seen a problem interaction from the juglone toxin in my plantings. Now that's finished compost and it's diluted out with lots of other organic matter. Um, how long does it last in the soil after a tree is taken out? Jug juglone is present in the roots. And so depending on how large that root volume was, it, it might be there for a while. Having said that, I have not really seen um, or had sent to me any real big problems with juglone toxicity from any number of vegetable plantings. And uh, like I said, I mulch with compost and I use my compost with plants that have historically been listed as having a problem with it, like say tomato family, and I've not had problems with that. I dilute mine out and I try to minimize that level of exposure. Allison, does that help you with your question? I have not seen really research-based information on how long those things last. Those are, those are not really common research um, asks or research topics. A lot of the information is more anecdotal. Yeah, in our case, it's actually the, the, there are trees all over the property. And so we're trying to, so finding a spot to situate a garden where it's not in the drip line of a black walnut tree has been a bit of a trick. Gotcha. Um, yes, because they're also very aggressive scavengers of your soil. So I have found that if I have a raised bed anywhere near a tree, not even necessarily in the drip line, um, that, that that is such preferred soil that they will actually send roots out and will start to grow up into the raised beds of um, uh, that are anywhere near those trees. In fact, um, I found that the walnut had grown roots into my compost pile where the roots had to grow up and over a concrete lip because I have my pile on a poured four by four pad, but they still went in there. So let's talk about mulch for a second. Personally, I think mulch is the number one tool in the toolbox of a grower. It does so many wonderful things. You have a couple different forms of mulches that you can use. Organic mulches that are commonly used are things like uh, hay or straw, maybe shredded leaves. Some folks will use lawn clippings as long as they have untreated lawn clippings. I used to use those uh, on a high rate and now basically I've moved mostly into plastic culture because I'm in the city and I don't have that source of uh, unlimited free spoiled horse hay like I used to have. But I will tell you, I love my black plastic mulch. It is a fabulous product. I use a woven product. Um, that way, 
I know that it's permeable. The woven product actually lets moisture and oxygen move through it. So I don't get that anaerobic environment underneath the mulch. So the roots that are under that are still gonna be able to get, um, they're gonna be able to get the effects of rainfall and, and the soil will dry out. Multiple benefits by mulch. Conserves soil moisture and it minimizes those peaks and valleys of that dry out, get wet, dry out, get wet. It cools the soil as well. Most plants would prefer that the soil temperature in the root zone is closer to about 70 degrees where it can get really, really hot otherwise. And then it does um, a number of other controls on things that I don't like to do. So basically my two least favorite jobs in the garden are to weed and to water and mulch takes care of those. So I like to call it work control. But Think of ways that you might be able to incorporate mulch around your plantings because uh, there's been a lot of research that shows that you will have much higher yields that way. If you use an organic form of mulch, like when I used to use um, hay a lot, I would just incorporate that into the garden in the fall so that that organic matter would break down into the soil. So crop rotation is another tool in your toolbox. And what crop rotation is, is a three year period of growing vegetables in the same family in the same space, okay? So you don't grow the same vegetables in the same family. And that's an important distinction in the same space. That allows any effects from diseases, pests, or weeds to minimize because you use different forms of management on different vegetable families, as well as plants from the same vegetable family are similarly impacted by diseases. But a lot of folks will tell me, Tim, I can't do a crop rotation in my space because I only have one raised bed. And so what do you do if you only have one raised bed and you want to minimize your impacts of disease or things like that. That's when you use the other tools that we talked about in your toolbox, right? That's where you would use a soil test to gauge the fertility needed for that individual planting. That's where you're working on your organic matter. The higher level of organic matter that you have in there, that is going to drive increased production yields. That's where we're using things like mulch to make sure that the environment where the roots are for that plant are in the healthiest state it can be. And you might want to pick a variety that is resistant to disease um, because there are multiple different varieties of lots of the different vegetables in the vegetable families that you can select for disease resistance. So if, if you can't do complete crop rotation or complete raised bed technique or, or complete any of the tools that we talked about, try to incorporate as much of those systems as you can into your production to get an increased effect by using lots of small inputs. So here's what I mean when we talk about vegetable families. Different vegetable families have different um, members in there. Think of them kind of like cousins, right? But when we look at, say, the Solanaceae family, which is the nightshades, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and potatoes are all cousins in the same family. So when you do your crop rotation planning, if you had, say, a production space that was in tomatoes, the next year you want to make sure that not only do you not plant tomatoes in that space if you can, but you wouldn't do peppers or eggplant or potatoes or other members of that family. Knowing it can be difficult to really do a great job with crop rotations, especially if you have less space than you wish, what I tell folks is, prioritize at least the three majorly impacted families by pest, weeds, and disease. And that would be Solanaceae, which is the tomato family. That would be the brassicas, right? Cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, collards. And then the third family that gets the most impacts from insects, pests, weeds, disease, things like that would be the cucurbits. So your zucchini, your pumpkins, um, summer squash, winter squash, vining fruits like uh, watermelon, cantaloupe, honeydew, cucumbers, things like that. Those are the three that I try to do my best job on crop rotation, but you guys saw my garden. That tractor is mixing all the soil in there. So knowing that I can't do a 100% perfect crop rotation, I still try to grow those three families in different locations in my same um, garden uh, from year to year. And that's where my plan comes in, where I can take pictures and I can find where I planted and, and make sure I modify my planting areas each year. So one of the things that uh, I like to follow is soil temperatures. And 
when we think about plants, both the roots and the seed of the plants all exist in the soil. So when we chart when to plant and when we chart um, the impacts that that temperature is going to have on plants, we don't do as much of air temperature monitoring outside of worried about frost. We like to monitor soil temperatures. And in the College of Food Ag, in our OARDC weather system, we have soil test or we have soil temperature monitoring stations throughout the state. The one that I use is the Columbus one. That is um, a soil test reading that is taken daily on Waterman Farm. And I checked it this morning and we are right about 70 degrees. And the interesting thing is, is soil temperatures move in response to air temperatures, but they change slower and they don't have quite the impact. But this 80 degree temperature run that we've had the last several days really drove soil temps up. So when you, if you went back before our cold snap, we were probably about 57, 58, 60 degrees. And a lot of people were planting their summer veg outside. Then we hit multiple nights in the 30s and even down into the high 20s. And that drove soil temps back down in the 40 degree and below range. Then they started to come back up and we entered that rainy phase and those cool nights drove the temps back down a little below 60, but now we're in the sweet spot in terms of planting your summer veg right now. So what can you plant right now? We are right on the far edge of spring planting. And I say that meaning that you can still do a lot of your spring planting veg right now, but I would kind of modify what I would plant and I would modify the form of what I would plant them in. I would probably put lettuce transplants in right now. I'm not sure if I would start lettuce from seed right now. Uh, the reason is started from seed, lettuce is probably gonna have a little bit of germination problems in warm soil, as well as you're gonna be maturing that in July when it gets really hot outside. Having said that, if you pick some of the varieties that do better with warm weather, like a black seeded Simpson or um, Four Season Marble or some of the romaine varieties, they tolerate heat a little bit better. Very similarly with radishes, if you started from seed right now, you're going to get maturation in the warm weather. And what that does is that makes radishes really spicy. But if you like that, go for it. I would probably still put some cabbage family stuff in, not from seed, however. You can still get transplants at the garden stores. Things like cabbage or broccoli or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts could go in the ground now. Um, although they're gonna mature in warm weather and they really like cool weather better. You could, do carrot, you could still do carrots. Onions, I wouldn't do from seed right now. Those would be best done from either um, sets, which is what looks like miniature onion bulbs, or from transplants, which are sort of skinny, dried out looking green onion things. Um, they have been grown to a certain stage and then they were, uh, they were pulled and sort of arrested in that stage and then growers put them in now. Onion seed, I wouldn't start right now. It, it just takes so long for them to germinate that you're probably going to miss that time window where they're going to need to um, ripen in the correct size. I'd still do potatoes easily. Those are planted from seed potatoes or planted from potatoes that you cut up so you have individual eyes, which is the growing point off a potato. Green onions are my sort of one, um, one outlier in the onion family. Those could be started from seed right now. They will grow just fine. Uh, and then beets and Swiss chard, both of those would be started from seed. Um, realize for both of those that when you plant those seeds, that's actually a seed packet and there's multiple seeds inside that little meteor looking thing in there that you'll need to thin those to the strongest one. And then now we are above 60 degrees, which is the bare minimum of uh, soil temperature planting for your summer veg, like your tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, things like that. So go right ahead and plant your zucchinis, all of those things, we are ready to go. Um, we are past the traditional last frost date by a good week or two, and I checked the 10 day. While we are supposed to have some evenings that goes down into the um, low 50s in the 10 day, I think we're in really good shape going forward. So I recommend that you plant right now uh, any of the summer veg that you wanna plant. And then what I recommend to folks is, don't just plant a whole pile of some one thing at one time if you have the ability to grow it in multiple small amounts 
or if you're going to grow it a lot, realize that there's a number of different crops that you can plant both in spring and in summer that you will get harvests over a long period of time because we have such a huge time window to plant them. For example, I just put in my third planting of green beans um, this past weekend. I started some green bean from seed about a month ago and I will do a small patch of green beans every two weeks all the way until probably the first week of August where that will give me a steady harvest for multiple months as opposed to one giant harvest right now. I do very similarly with cucumbers and zucchini, especially because they can be really negatively impacted by insects, uh, cucumber beetles and things like that. And I do the same thing with basil. I, um, I grow basil multiple times during the year. When you're growing basil, it, you know when it gets to that point where it's starting to try to go to seed and, and the flower heads coming up and you're trimming it and you have, you know, the leaves are getting tinier and they're not really that beautiful, productive basil that it was earlier in its life cycle. You know, basil's an annual and once it gets to that point, I say let it go. I start basil at least three times during the season. I've already got some started right now that I'll eat early in the season. I'll do a second planting to have great um, tender leaves ready for when my tomatoes are ready. And then I like to do a fall basil planting because what I'm gonna do is I'm going to dry some leaves and I'm gonna turn some into pesto so that I have some over the winter. So, you know, a lot of these, when we get a lot of these packets of seed like basil, you're gonna have a packet that might have like 200 seeds in it. That's enough basil for multiple years of all you can eat basil. So if you have the ability to plant multiple se sequential plantings, um, take advantage of that so that you get a harvest deep into the year. And then container gardening. So I mentioned that my yard is deep shade under walnuts, maples, and hackberries. I have a little tiny patch of sun, but it's on my driveway. And so I grow in containers. And what has really driven the increase in container gardening, and container gardening is actually my second most commonly asked for class, is this innovation right here in this front row. So these plastic pots I got years ago at a yard sale for a buck a piece, I'm never going to find that deal again. But large containers and and when we grow in vegetables we need really large containers because vegetables grow giant over time i mean if you think of where a six to eight inch tall tomato transplant ends up at six to eight feet tall over a multi-month season with heavy production you need a giant container to hold the root volume of that plant so these are called grow bags and they're sort of this newish innovation in um in growing that came out of the nursery and landscape industry. They're a woven felt. They come in uh, lots of different sizes from one gallon to a hundred gallon bag that I've seen people put dwarf fruit trees in. So I have a container garden and I have a community garden and they work really, really well because I use these to grow year round. My community garden basically goes from April 1st to November 1st. My heaviest production in my container garden goes from about September through about mid-June. Right now I have uh, lots of spring veg in my containers. It's on my driveway. That microclimate gets really hot, right? Black bags on black top. Once we get in July and August, those bags are smoking hot and they dry out fast in that kind of heat. So I use my containers a little less in the summer, but that's okay because my community garden is in heavy production at that time. All right, so weeds. Um, this is actual picture from Wallace Community Gardens where I garden and my community garden is a victory garden remnant that has been around for like 75 years and it has more weed seeds in it per square meter. You cannot believe it. This is what it, every single plot would look like if it was not worked and planted. This was my next door neighbor plot um, from a couple years ago. They signed up to garden but then they never showed up and the weeds were about three feet tall by the first um, week of June and they're not quite that level now because we had some serious cold earlier um, but but they're getting there and they are everywhere. So when you are doing your weed control you have really one cardinal rule with weeds and that is do not let it go to seed. Annual weeds, if you can stop them when they're going to seed before they seed set, you have killed that plant forever. Perennials, you want to keep whacking at them. 
don't let them go to seed. They're going to be harder to kill over time. You have lots of different um, herbicide options. You could tarp them, but, but you need to deplete those root reserves that are in there. And each time you kill a perennial before it is able to set seed, you are burning its root reserves up. All right, I saw a bunch of questions in the chat. All right. All right, great. Yep, weather station info, I love it. I will definitely share um, at the end of this a bunch of resources that I think you guys will find very um, helpful. Container gardening, I will be happy to come back and do a container gardening class for you guys specific, um, as well as I have um, both written informative article on my website and a recorded webinar on container gardening. Um, but, but I'd be happy to come back and do that. And my container basil always looks awesome and then starts dropping leaves no matter what I do. Yeah, it's an annual and so over time it is going to just run out of steam. If you're growing it in the same container year round too, you might be worried that you're developing some, uh, some of the various diseases that can affect basil and um, and, and make sure that you have a container that is sized appropriately. Basil can grow for pretty long and develop a pretty decent uh, root volume as well. If you guys want a container class, I would be delighted to come back. Okay, so when we talk about integrated pest management, people contact me all the time and they say, I, I'm seeing bugs on my plants, how do I kill them? And what I tell them is, let's figure out what the bug is first because you actually have allies in your garden. There is a whole host of beneficial insects that are out there that want to basically work with you because they're going to feed on the bad bugs. For example, when we look at this, on the picture on the left, that is a tomato hornworm that I placed on that fence post. Um, if you've never seen a tomato hornworm, they're giant. It's as big as your finger. They can eat most of a tomato plant down to the ground. So on the left, that is a bad bug and you would want to kill that bug because it can cause serious devastation in your tomatoes. On the right, there is a tomato hornworm, but it is covered with all of these little white um, little egg casings and these are eggs of a parasitic wasp that is a beneficial. So the wasp laid all of these eggs on the hornworm and that hornworm is now paralyzed and it's unable to feed. When these eggs hatch they will drill into this hornworm, feed on it from the inside out and then you will have a host of beneficial wasps flying around killing all the other hornworms. So you recognize that this is one that you would kill and this is one that you would not because if you kill this, you're basically going to kill hundreds of good bugs. So the key thing is, when you find a bug in there, identify it first to make sure that you know that it's one that you want to get rid of, and then realize also the effect that any kind of pesticide is going to have on pollinators, because for the most part, pollinators are absolute sissies compared to the bugs that you want to get rid of, and if you kill the pollinators, you do not get a harvest. All right, so let's see if this video works. Oh, you're not going to do. Sometimes when the PowerPoint goes, it goes. Oh, well. Um, I'm going to stop my share, and I'm going to jump into the chat. And I am going to, um, you guys dump stuff in the chat. I want to share a couple different resources right now that are out there that you guys can use especially for folks that are getting new to gardening. So, da, 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 da. this is the website Growing Franklin that I maintain for OSU Extension here in Franklin County. And what I put on this is I put basically all the informative articles, all the webinar recordings, all of uh, the class events and things like that that are upcoming. And the first thing is, when you look at information for growers on the main page here, if you want a basic written fact sheet breakdown that would be perfect for a brand new gardener, at the very top, this first link is the garden planning fact sheet. And that is a nine pager that goes over a lot of what I went over in the first chunk of this um, today's class, but in much greater detail. 
It goes over things about soil health. It goes over um, the succession plantings. And then what I like about it too is it has a really nice chart that has planting times and planting spacing. Um, just realize that this is sort of row garden spacing. So if you're gonna do raised beds, you kind of change this from two dimensional to a uh, more three dimensional one. And then take a look at different things in here. So like um, I just put this out today, I'm gonna be doing a class uh, in partnership with GCGC, Greater Columbus Growing Coalition in a couple of weeks on Thursday, June 7th and 7th, that'll be about tomatoes. Um, generally, these are all free and open to the public. You guys are all welcome to come. This one does have registration, but you click on that and you, um, will be sent the Zoom link. And that is because GCGC has a uh, requirement that for anybody that wants to join, has to attend one class. And, and because we're working virtually, that is the one class that we put on this. Um, my colleague Jenny Lopp is doing a food preservation course that is already started or no, starts here shortly. Uh, these are all free and open to the public as well. We're having a matching increase in asks for food preservation that sort of partners very well with the increase in asks for gardening. Um, and then a whole bunch of other classes that we've done in the past where for a lot of these I have done, say, uh, like container gardening, this is a webinar, you click on this and then you watch a prior Zoom class that way. If you don't feel like watching webinars anymore because you're sick of looking at Zoom, um, this was one that I got so many asks for that I actually built a article that goes through all the points of this um, step by step. All right, so Allison, that is probably one of my favorite classes to teach is planting the fall garden because fall is an absolutely dynamite season to grow in. If you think about it, we still have tons of sunshine. The bugs start to go away. The rain comes back, but generally it's not in um, heavy sort of spring rain that way. And you can plant a number of vegetables where if you do just some very basic season extension, which could be even just throwing a sheet over to protect from frost damage in the evening, that you can get produce harvest all the way uh, to Thanksgiving. And I commonly will eat at Thanksgiving dinner veg I grew myself in my community garden um, just by doing some basic techniques. So I am doing uh, a class uh, I, for fall planting. I already have several of them scheduled, but if you guys would like that class, I would be happy to come back and do that because there are some little tips and tricks about planting in the fall just to make sure that you realize what is pollinator dependent, what's not pollinator dependent. Um, but generally the pollinators are super happy when you plant a fall garden because everything else is dying and they're looking for some flowers. So I get generally really good pollination then. All right, we're at two o'clock on the nickel. And so um, I'm happy to stick around if we got a couple more questions in the chat. If not, I wanna put in here my email so that you guys, my client residents, if you have any questions or concerns or you see a, a funny looking bug or you have a weed that you need identified, feel free to send me pictures and I will be happy to assist you guys um, as we stay home virtually. Right. Rabbits from a raised beds. Um, so nuisance wildlife is the bane of my existence and I use, um, I use bird netting that I trellis over my container garden. Uh, I can't really do anything at my community garden because it's multi-acre without a fence other than trying to kind of fence in some stuff that they would really eat well like my green beans. For my containers, um, rabbits, chipmunks, and squirrels would get in there and cause all kind of havoc. So that is completely wrapped in bird netting right now. Hmm. Good to know. Anybody have any more questions for Tim? I just want to tell, say thank you, Tim, for, for this presentation. It has been awesome. I've just been seeing a lot of good feedback in our chat. And, oh, my uh, pleasure. Thank you for organizing. <laughs> Oh, no worries. It was as Jason uh, was one of the ones that gave us a heads up on this. Um, would you be interested in, or, or could we have you back next month? If, if I have to take it up to our culture team and just to make sure it's okay. But. I will be doing virtual classes. Um, I, I have no plans to stop. It's going to, even when we get back in the, um, 
you know, where I can do in-person classes at other places. I think I'm going to continue doing as many of these as I can, especially within OSU, because quite honestly, the most popular time ask that I'm getting for folks is right around now, that sort of lunch and learn time where you, it's a team building activity, it's a professional development activity. Um, that is my most popular ask is can we do something between say uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock to break the day up a little bit and, um, and, I mean, you're still staring at Zoom, but hopefully it's a, a little less um, brain intensive. And um, and so I would be delighted to come back, take a look at whatever uh, class topic you want. Happy to do container gardening, um, pest weeds and diseases. You guys just let me know. And um, Barbara knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, you guys actually all know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> right? Yeah, you gave away your info. Yeah, that's all right. I encourage everybody, if you got a question or a problem, just send me an email. I, I try to check my email seven days a week. Right now I'm scheduling, I have a little bit of time in the second week of June. I'm gonna go on vacation the third week of June. Um, um, and after that point, I have really good availability. So would you like do like a, a, a follow up to this class, like more of an advanced one, or what do you think would be a good one? So, I mean, you guys tell me what you want me to do. Uh, what I do a lot with my programming is I try to move sort of seasonally. And um, so I will do what I used to do when I was able to go on site is in partnership with like a, an urban farm or a community garden, I would have what's known as a garden walk where the people would invite me to come to their space. When I came there, I would kind of go over the scouting reports for the insects and the weeds that we're seeing right now that are really heavy and, and are really causing a lot of problems. Then I go over weather predictions. Um, and then I go over like, here's what you can plant now, or here's what is ideal for harvest. And then I just say to folks, now ask your questions and, and people, we just walk to different people's places and they get to ask questions about what they're growing. Uh, so it's a little less structured and a little bit more interactive and a little more Q and A, we could do that. Um, or you guys could pick a, uh, another topic that would be um, a little more in depth, like a integrated pest management one for pest weeds and diseases. Um, container gardening is one that if you want to do focal stuff, uh, I just love my container garden. It gives me so much less problems in my community garden. It's unbelievable. And, um, and another one that's a fun class that's a little more advanced that is uh, later in the season one is how to use season extension to plant so that you can harvest over the course of the winter. Is that the actual name of it? That's a name. That's a long name. <laughs> that's a long name. I might need to tighten that name up a little bit. <laughs> you guys, uh, if feel free to wordsmith that into a smaller one. But yeah, I overwinter spinach and kale pretty much every year under row cover and, um, wow. and harvest that. Mm, interesting. Great. Yeah. So season extension and, and things like that are fun. And there's, that's another one where there's great innovations that are inexpensive that people can use in the home environment. Um, and it just allows you to get some extra veg into your system, you know, in February. That's amazing. So my biggest takeaway of this today is that mulch sounds like it's very important component of gardening that. Yes, I, I do. I think so. Um, I thought about mulching a garden to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, a vegetable garden. <laughs> yeah, especially like I get a lot of questions about tomatoes and the different fungal diseases that affect tomatoes because there's a, basically there's a number of different fungal disease, early blight, late blight, septoria leaf spot. Um, and a lot of those are caused when it rains or there's overhead irrigation, the fungal spores are in the soil and they splash up on the tomato leaves. And that's why you kind of get tomatoes where the leaves at the bottom of the plant start turning yellow and brown and falling down. That is a, a fungal blight that is spreading. So I use mulch around my tomatoes, knowing that I'm still going to get the blight over time because you, you can't completely stop it. But I try to make sure that I'm getting tomatoes in August and September and October and try to make my tomatoes die from cold and not from disease. And the, the, the work mulch does on soil cooling and, and suppressing weeds, things like that. Um, it, it, there's, there's lots of great data on increasing your production on that. What type of mulch did you say you used? So I, um, my predominant mulch that I use is a, um, a black plasticulture mulch. Its name is Sunbelt. The company that makes it is DeWitt. 
I buy it in large rolls on Amazon. Uh, there is an initial upfront expense, but I try to take really good care of, of my grow bags, my plastic ultra mulch, my row cover, all of those purchased inputs. Um, I'm on like year five with my plastic and it, it looks brand new. I buy, it's super heavy weight stuff. So a roll initially at a hundred bucks, we're now down to 20 bucks a year. Um, I don't cut holes in it. Like you'll see, a lot of folks will actually cut holes and plant right through it. Um, I try to bring mine up kind of close up the sides of my raised beds and then have a narrow space where I plant in, um, you know, like as a patch. And then I put organic uh, compost mulch around the plants. So I use a lot of that plastic culture mulch in my pathways and then up close on a lot of plantings. And um, Straw, if I can get it inexpensively, straw prices are pretty expensive now. You have to go out in the country to find straw where it's not gonna break the bank. All right, gang. Barbara, you let me know what, uh, what the team wants for class number two, and then we'll pick a date and I'm happy to do it. You guys have been a great crowd, great questions. Um, otherwise, stay cool out there. I'm waiting for the weekend where it goes back into the 70s. I'm more cabbage than pepper. I, I like cool, uh, cool and cloudy more than hot and sunny, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tim. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you. The team on, on Friday, and we'll discuss and, and figure out what we're going to do from there, having you back. Cool. Okay. Well, thank All you. All right. Thanks, gang. Have a good one. You too. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.